American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcast. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about Samuel Mazzucchelli, the great missionary of the Upper Midwest. He was a priest, a founder of parishes and schools, architect and builder, linguist and translator, catechist and apologist, human rights advocate, and devoted shepherd of souls. He did many things and did them all well. Yes, he did. So, Father Mazzucchelli, his name is clearly Italian, but the Italians were a later immigrant bloc, not coming to America until the late 19th century. The early Catholic clergy in this country were almost all Irish and French. Where did the Italian come from? Milan, actually. He was born Carlo Gaetano Samuele Mazzucchelli in 1806. That very Italian name must have been very out of place in the American frontier. Uh, Yeah, it was. Later in his life, his Irish parishioners actually took to calling him not Matsukeli, but Matthew Kelly. (laughs) Much easier for them to pronounce. Yes, indeed. Samuel Matsukeli was the son of a wealthy and well-positioned family, so it was with disappointment that his father consented to let him follow his heart and become a Dominican at 17 years old. By 22, he had been ordained a subdeacon in Rome, and then followed his heart even further afield. To the missionary field of America. All the way there. A fellow Dominican, Edward Fenwick, had been named Bishop of Cincinnati in 1822, and he needed priests for missionary work. The Diocese of Cincinnati at the time covered the entirety of the Northwest Territory, which meant all of the states of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, plus the territory which is now Michigan and Wisconsin. Samuel Metzikelli was eager to take on that work. This is a vast territory, and Bishop Fenwick had quite a priest shortage. Right. Outside of the immediate area of Cincinnati, he had no other priests. There had been Jesuits up in Michigan and Wisconsin, but they had left about 60 years earlier after the Jesuits were suppressed. So whomever Bishop Fenwick got to help him out would not only be evangelizing the pagans, he would also become a parish priest to faithful who had been without the sacraments on the regular for nearly two generations. And Samuel Mazzucchelli rushed into this ministry. With gusto. He arrived in Cincinnati at 22 years old in 1828. Bishop Fenwick was eager to get this young and energetic Dominican out into the field, so he petitioned the Vatican for a dispensation to ordain Mazzucchelli early. The dispensation was granted, and then shortly after he was ordained at 23 years old, He was off for a life of adventure. For his first year in that vast territory west and northwest of Ohio, he was the only priest. And even once other priests were assigned to help him, there weren't many, and his works were among the most notable. His first assignment was on Mackinac Island, way up between the two Michigan peninsulas. St. Anne Church on the island had been established by the Jesuits in the 17th century, but as I mentioned, the Jesuits had left in 1765 after they were suppressed. So St. Anne had been without a regular priest for two generations. Occasional visits from traveling priests and lay leadership had kept the parish alive and in relatively good condition, so Father Mazzucchelli had a parish community and a church. A house was built for him, and he promptly set to work with the European settlers and the natives alike. But Father Mazzucchelli wasn't just ministering to his Catholic parishioners and attempting to convert pagan natives. He also had to deal with a challenge from Protestant pastors in the area. Yes, indeed. There were Presbyterians and Methodists in the area already, and the Presbyterian minister in particular, William Ferry, was an aggressive and very anti-Catholic preacher. He had done a lot to try to convince the Catholics in the area to become Presbyterian. When Father Mazzucchelli arrived, he had to up his game. So Ferry began a series of six weekly lectures that he believed would demolish the reasons anyone would have for being Catholic. Father Mazzucchelli, of course, was a Dominican. Right, and being a Dominican, this sort of thing was right up his alley. So Father Mazzucchelli attended the lectures himself. He did. And he let it be known that he would give a lecture in response to each of Ferry's lectures on the following Sunday. But unlike Ferry, Father Mazzucchelli would allow listeners to interrupt and ask questions during his talk. Ferry did not attend Father's responses. The effect was sensational. 
Rather than Catholics abandoning their faith, Father actually won converts. Some converts cited his willingness to engage the listeners and field their questions. Also cited was his warmth and humor in his delivery, as well as his earnest attempt to communicate despite his thick Italian accent. Reminds me of Dominicans I know today. Unafraid to wade into controversy and bring clarity with charity. In fact, with Father Masichelli, there was one particularly powerful testimony to his effectiveness. Yes, a Protestant missionary named Persis Skinner wrote in a Protestant missionary magazine, quote, There is a priest in this locale, an Italian who, they say, came from an opulent family of Rome, and who, despite the characteristics of Italians of his rank, the softness, the refinement, and luxury, is content to take food and room with an Indian and adapt to the conditions of the place in order to propagate the Church of Rome. He is a true and faithful servant of his master and manifests a zeal, a patience, and a perseverance that Christians would do well to imitate. Really shows the respect that even Protestants had for him. Yes, and that was a common sentiment. He was tireless in his efforts to win souls no matter where he was. And that included learning multiple languages, like the language of the Winnebago, to go along with the French and English he had already learned. Right. He even published a prayer book for the Winnebago, which he completed in 1833, just before his replacement arrived in Mackinac and he was transferred. His second headquarters was in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where he had already established a parish in 1831. And just like in Michigan, once he was in Wisconsin, he quickly learned the language of the native people, this time the Chippewa, well enough that he could publish a liturgical almanac in their language. He got to reach the people in the way that they can be reached. Yeah, upon his arrival in Green Bay, he did a number of things in just a few years. He built a church for the parish, literally doing a fair amount of the labor himself, and building it according to his own architectural designs. He founded a school for the Menominee natives and learned their language. And in 1836, he was invited to address the first legislature of the Wisconsin Territory. And all the while, as he traveled all over Wisconsin and down into Illinois and even across the Mississippi into Iowa, he was establishing parishes and building churches and schools. In all, over the years, he designed and built more than 20 churches, five of which still stand today, including the Cathedral of St. Raphael in Dubuque, Iowa. That much construction could only have meant a great influx of people was coming to the Northwest. Yes. During this period, the federal government was buying large tracts of land from Native tribes and making it available for pioneers who were willing to move west and homestead. So thousands of Catholics were moving into that vast territory. But Father Mazzucchelli was still the only priest in Wisconsin, northern Illinois, and western Iowa. He traveled extensively to meet the needs as he could. But with this rapid expansion, there were also great injustices that were done to the native tribes by the government. And Father Masichelli protested this mistreatment, even writing to President Andrew Jackson himself. Right. In a letter he wrote to President Jackson, Father Masichelli hoped to secure the money that had been promised in the Treaty of Rock Island in 1831 to build a school for the Winnebago Indians of central Wisconsin. He presented to the president his own record of success at educating the natives and his knowledge of their language. The sum promised was about $3,000 annually, which would be more than $87,000 today. The letter was ineffective, however, as the man responsible for Indian affairs in that part of the country, the future president, Zachary Taylor, wouldn't allow any money to go to an Italian Catholic priest. Instead, the money went to a poorly attended Protestant school. Father Mazzucchelli lamented this and many other injustices done to the natives, saying, quote, It will be their fate to continue in their wild, roving, and uncivilized state until the day when the civilized population of European origin will have filled the entire continent. Then the Indian will have left scarcely a trace of his existence in the land, unquote. Prophetic words. Truly. His work in the remote Green Bay region of Wisconsin would come to a close in the late 1830s when his center of operations moved to the more populous tri-state region of Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa. This period saw his greatest work at designing and building churches and even laying out the town of Shoalsburg, Iowa, and having a hand in the design of the new state house in Iowa City. It was also during this time that the Irish portion of his flock gave him his new name. Yes, the Irish miners loved their priest, but had no patience for Matsukeli, especially when a perfectly good Irish name was available. So they, of course, started calling him Father Matthew Kelly. And the name was used by more than just the Irish. Right. When the Diocese of Dubuque was established in 1839, the bishop, Matthias Loris, called him by that name. Since Bishop Loris named Father Mazzucchelli Vicar General of Dubuque, his use of the nickname showed how much respect and affection he had for the Italian priest. He did, but Father Mazzucchelli did not stop being a missionary. It's just that now his missionary work took on the added heft of being Vicar General. 
When the Iowa legislature convened for the first time, he convinced the state Senate to meet for a time in his newly built and not yet dedicated church. He also attempted to establish a province of Dominican friars in the West, but that effort didn't get off the ground due to lack of men answering the call to priesthood in that area. Right, but he had greater success in two other important endeavors. First, he established a college for young men in Cincinnati, Wisconsin in 1846, of which he was the first president and chief teacher. And the very next year, he founded a community of Dominican sisters at Cincinnati to help run and teach at the college. That community still exists, preaching and teaching and maintaining a home for the elderly. But he wasn't made to be a stationary priest tied to a college. No. The traveling missionary spirit was too strong in him. So in 1849, he turned over ownership and governance of that college to the Dominican friars at Somerset, Ohio, and he returned to the missionary field. His home base was the parish in Benton, Wisconsin, but he traveled extensively to surrounding missions. In Benton, he assisted the Sisters of the Congregation of the Holy Rosary in founding a school for girls, and not just Catholic girls. Protestant families sent their girls to it also. And he spent the next 15 years doing more of the same, caring for souls, teaching, administering the sacraments. He was known to hear confessions for 14 hours some days. He came to love his adopted country, or at least its ideals, but he never shied away from criticizing its warts, chief among them slavery and the mistreatment of natives. When the Civil War broke out, he lamented it, but he didn't live to see its end. Father Samuel Mazzucchelli died in February of 1864 of pneumonia. He had contracted the disease while on a sick call to a far distant house in bitterly cold weather. When his body was prepared for burial, they found that he had worn an iron chain around his waist, and he had worn it so long that parts of it had actually grown into his skin. That chain is available for veneration at Cincinnati Mount, which is still the home of the Cincinnati Dominicans. Father Masichelli's cause for canonization was opened in 1964, and in 1993, Pope St. John Paul II declared him venerable. In 2008, a miraculous healing was attributed to his intercession. If affirmed as a miracle, it will enable his being declared blessed. A title Father Matthew Kelly certainly seems to deserve. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please be sure to give us a rating and a review. To learn more about today's topic, to find previous episodes, and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash history. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on social media at facebook.com slash American Catholic History or follow StarQuest on Twitter at sqpn. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. If you speak in Italian, you will be strangled by the end of the podcast. Mechiamo Tommaso. <laughs>